Hi, I'm Toby Rates. I'm the Executive Director of the Autism Society of Oregon. I'm here today to talk about Autism Spectrum Disorder. And I want to start off by saying I am not an educator, nor am I a medically trained person. I am the parent of two wonderful sons who are on the autism spectrum. Now starting off with what is autism? Autism is defined as autism spectrum disorder. It is a neurobiological difference that affects the brain development in terms of communication, as well as social interaction, and is often represented with restricted interests as well as repetitive behaviors. Also present are sensory issues. People on the autism spectrum often present with a sensory processing disorder, although it's not necessarily the other way. There are people who have sensory processing disorder who are not on the autism spectrum. The main thing I like people to get about any discussion about what autism is, is that every person on spectrum is different. How people present what autism is for them is gonna change from person to person and that's probably the most important thing to know about autism. Before I go further into autism spectrum disorder, I want to say a little something about language. Within the disability community, the preference is for person-first language, someone who uses a wheelchair rather than wheelchair-bound, for example. Within the autism community, that's a little bit more controversial, and actually everything in the autism community is controversial, but people who have expressed a preference, who are on spectrum, tend to prefer identity first language. So the preference would be for autistic person rather than person who experiences autism. I tend to try to honor that preference. I know it's not universal. Also, I will sometimes use language of being on spectrum or on the spectrum, which hopefully doesn't offend anyone. Back to what is autism spectrum disorder, and the first thing we look at is communication differences. Some 30 to 40 percent of people on spectrum are nonverbal, which means they either do not have any spoken language or their spoken language isn't functional. They may repeat what's said, but they don't necessarily are comprehending or actually communicating with that language. But even people who are verbal, who are speaking, may process language differently. Oftentimes it can take longer to process language, and that has nothing to do with intellectual ability. The other thing is that people who are autistic are not generally processing nonverbal communication. So picking up social cues, body language, that sort of thing. And in any given conversation, that can be 70% of what's being communicated. So that's a lot of information that is not being picked up by someone who is autistic. And when you look at someone who is nonverbal and is, or is verbal but is having difficulty processing language at the speed that we typically use, plus they're not getting the nonverbal communication, it can make the world an extremely confusing place. For social interaction, if you're not picking up social cues, it can make social interaction much, much more difficult. There is a myth that we'll talk about later that people on spectrum are not interested in social interaction. Once it's gonna depend on the person. Some people are, some people aren't. Generally speaking, the people who are are having a more difficult time with social interaction because they're not picking up on social cues or their verbal communication is not at the same rate as other people's. What I often say is, with someone who's autistic and they're not picking up social cues, the kindest thing you can do is to be direct. If you try and, you know, someone is, is a little too close in your personal space and you take a few steps back hoping they'll get the hint, no, an autistic person is generally not going to get that hint and they will move forward back into your space. So it is actually much kinder for you to say, you know what, you're a little too close, please take two steps back and then let's keep talking. Similarly, if someone's going on about a, an area of intense interest, which are very commonly found for people on spectrum, there are these areas of restricted interest um, that are of great importance to the person. But they may not catch on if you're yawning or stifling a yawn or looking away. And it is much kinder to simply say, you know what, I think I've heard enough about Egyptian mummification for today. I would, let's take a break on that. Or you can tell me two more facts and then let's talk about something else. With regard to restricted interests under autism, this, there's a saying that a lot of people on spectrum have interests that are an inch wide and a mile deep. 
You can also learn a lot from those folks. The other part of autism is repetitive behaviors, are what are called STEMs, self-stimulating behaviors. That's sort of the stereotypical flapping or rocking, and sometimes it can be a verbal noise that's being made. Generally speaking, those STEMs are helpful to people who are on spectrum. It's helping them process the environment and their surroundings. It may be helping to calm them down. It may also just be an expression of pure joy. The consensus is, unless the STEM is harmful to someone or themselves, such as head banging, you really don't want to stop it. Let that stimming occur. It's helping the person, it's enjoyable for them, and as, like I said, as long as it's not harmful to them or others, it's perfectly appropriate. Then finally, we have sensory issues. These can be the most difficult things for someone on the spectrum to handle. People on the autism spectrum can process sensory input differently. They can either be highly attuned and they're getting far too much sensory input, so touch is unbearable, or noises that wouldn't bother other people are overwhelming. Fluorescent lights, for example, that little tiny clicking noise it makes can be overwhelming to someone. Now try and sit in a classroom with a fluorescent light going like that, and it's overwhelming to you, and someone is expecting you to pay attention to algebra. That creates a lot of problems. Also, people can be undersensitive to sensory input. People who are looking for sensory input are often called sensory seekers. For example, my younger son, he loves deep pressure hugs. When he's upset, he would go and roll himself in his um, bed covers, and we used to call it the Jakey Burrito. Um, but it, it's just a way of getting that extra sensory input because they're not getting enough from what's around them. And just to make it interesting, people can be oversensitive in some of their senses and undersensitive in others. So this is why it goes back to the saying that every person on the autism spectrum is different. So some basic facts about autism. One in 59 children is diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder by the age of eight. This is from the CDC. This, of course, does not get those people who are diagnosed after age eight, which happens often, particularly with women. Autism is a lifelong developmental disorder. Oftentimes people can develop coping mechanisms, and sometimes some of the more difficult sensory impacts are reduced, but people who are autistic stay autistic. Autistic children become autistic adults. There is assumed to be a genetic link in autism, that can run in families, but not always. Sometimes people have not had anyone in their family diagnosed with autism or who they assume was autistic. It is much more commonly diagnosed in men, in males. Five times more boys than girls are diagnosed. And as I mentioned, we're looking at diagnosis rates by age eight. And oftentimes girls are more socially adept naturally, and oftentimes they are not diagnosed until social issues become more difficult oftentimes in later elementary school or middle school. Autism frequently occurs with other diagnoses. I believe some 86% of people on the autism spectrum have a co-diagnosis, and over 50% have four or more co-diagnoses. Those co-diagnoses can include seizure disorder, sleep disorder, gastrointestinal difficulties, fragile X, ADHD, OCD, ODD, anxiety disorder, depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, Down syndrome, it really runs the gamut. And some of those co-diagnoses can be the most difficult thing for people to deal with. As kids on spectrum grow older, we are finding that 50% do not graduate with a regular high school diploma. They're getting a modified high school diploma or simply not getting a high school diploma in almost half the cases. And that 70% of autistic adults are either unemployed or underemployed. And those are statistics that ASO is working to change. So when I talk about autism spectrum disorder, I oftentimes bring up my two sons. I, they are both on the autism spectrum and they are very, very different. My older son, Willie, doesn't require much in the way of supports. He does have a lot of sensory differences and he, as a young child, did have issues with echolalia, developing speech. But now at 19, he has graduated high school with a regular diploma. He has a YouTube channel, he is traveling, he has a job, 
and he does not require much in the way of supports. Now, one thing about Willie is that we have a deal that as long as I'm talking about him, I have to mention his YouTube channel, which is called Canubis, K-H-A-N-U-B-I-S, and which he is very proud of. So my younger son, Jake, who's also pictured, does require far more in the way of supports. He is completely non-speaking. He doesn't have any verbal language whatsoever, but he does communicate. He communicates with signs, he communicates with pictures, he communicates with what I call significant looks. He'll look at candy, look back at me, look back at the candy. He makes it clear what he wants. He does process language receptively. He can understand a lot of what is said as long as it is concrete, direct, and kept to one-step directions. If you give him three things to do, you know, Jake, put on your shoes and socks, go brush your teeth and get in the car, he's going to do the last thing you said because that's how he processes language. The next slide is how does autism present? One thing about autism spectrum disorder is that when people hear spectrum, they often think of a number line, that you're somewhere on this line and you're a little bit more or a little bit less autistic. And that's not really how it works. It's much more similar to the kaleidoscope that's on the slide. You can be anywhere within having differences in language, with motor skills, perception, executive functioning, and sensory impacts. And all of those can be impacted anywhere within that circle. That's why I go back to saying that everyone who's on the autism spectrum is going to present differently, because they're going to be somewhere within that kaleidoscope rather than on a line. And how people present is going to change depending on how they're feeling, if they're hungry or getting ill, they're going to have a lot less ability to present well. Also, whether they've had any therapy and supports, and just where they are in their own development. Puberty changes everything. Some myths about autism. There are a number of myths out there about autism, particularly as it relates to how autistic people relate to the world around them. Some of the myths include things like people on the autism spectrum don't have empathy, which is one of my pet peeves. People on the autism spectrum have empathy just as much or as little as anyone else. It's going to vary from person to person. But oftentimes people on spectrum display empathy differently than someone might expect. And there's also been some research showing that some people on spectrum have a too much empathy, and as a result, they sort of shut down. Instead of showing that empathy, it comes across as not having empathy. One of the reasons why it's my pet peeve is that I feel strongly that people on the autism spectrum are not getting enough empathy. They are going through life in a very confusing world that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to them in a lot of ways and hasn't been explained to them verbally, and now having a lot of sensory issues to deal with, and they're still functioning, and they're still expected to function without a whole lot of empathy from the neurotypicals around them. Neurotypicals refers to people who aren't autistic. Other myths about autism include people on the autism spectrum aren't interested in social relationships. Oftentimes they are, depends on the person, but they oftentimes have difficulty in making those social connections. Another myth about people on spectrum is that they are violent. There's far more research to show that people on the autism spectrum are much more likely to be victims of violent crime than to be perpetrators. And they are innately subject to bullying and exploitation. Another final myth of people on autism spectrum is that they are suffering or unhappy. There's a great meme going around that says, I don't suffer from autism, I suffer from other people. I would say personally that people I have met on the autism spectrum they are not unhappy. They're enjoying life. They enjoy stimming, for example. They wish they didn't upset other people and that they had more empathy from other people, but they do not suffer from autism. So the final truth that I always want to leave people with about autism spectrum disorder is that every person on the autism spectrum is a unique individual. Everyone has different needs, wants, abilities, strengths, lifestyles, and goals. And the way you interact with someone who's autistic is by finding out about as much of that particular person as you can. One of the things that I always get asked is, 
why autism is so much more prevalent now than it used to be. And on the slide, you can see that we have gone from, in 1994, one in 2,500 children was diagnosed with autism, to now, as of 2016, one in 59 children. And even higher, depending on how that's tabulated. There's really three parts to that answer. One is that we have far better awareness of autism. When I was growing up, you know, no one talked about autism. The only thing I ever remember about autism, of course, was Rain Man. And before that, a documentary about children in institutions who were absolutely unreachable. So to consider that your child might be autistic was one of the worst things in the world. And that, fortunately, has changed a lot. Another part of that sort of three-legged stool is the idea that in 1994, the um, diagnostic criteria changed. And children who previously were either not diagnosed or were misdiagnosed are now getting autism diagnoses, which to my mind is a good thing. Those children who are falling through the cracks and not getting supports and services or getting therapies that weren't useful to them now have an autism diagnosis and hopefully they're getting the supports and services that they need. The third part is that, yes, we are seeing an increase in autism. And no one quite knows why, but that is one of the parts of the increase. And that also leads into the question of what causes autism, which is also a question that comes up quite a bit. The short answer is no one knows for sure. The scientific consensus seems to be that there is a genetic component and possibly an environmental trigger. What that environmental trigger could be has created a, an enormous amount of controversy. What we at the Autism Society of Oregon do, our mission is to help improve the lives of everyone who's impacted by autism throughout the state of Oregon. We focus, therefore, on how to improve the lives of people who are autistic, as well as their caregivers, their family members, and so forth. And we don't spend a great deal of time on what causes might be. Our view is much more practical. Let's try and help people who need help now. Talking about how to help support people who are on the autism spectrum as a family member or caregiver, the golden rule is always respect. Among the things to do, are to be calm. I have found that my children will mimic my affect. So the more upset I get, the more excited they are. And I found a long time ago that if I'm yelling and screaming, it's for my benefit, not for theirs. Be patient. People on the autism spectrum may need extra time to process language. They may not understand what you're saying. It may not make sense to them. Patience is going to be a virtue. Give people space. You will probably not get personal space from a lot of people on Spectrum, but at the same time, particularly due to sensory issues, they're going to need their own personal space. So always be careful. Don't touch someone, even in a very minor way, without first checking with them, because the touch may be something that's too much for them to handle. Listen and observe. People on the autism spectrum have communication differences, but one of the best ways to communicate with someone non-verbally is by observing them because behavior is communication. If behavior is communication, the way you listen to someone is by observing them carefully and then making decisions based on that. Allow extra time for a response. A lot of people on spectrum process language differently. Oftentimes it can be a lot of work to process language. It's almost as if someone is speaking in a language that's not their native tongue and they're not fluent in it. It takes that extra level of concentration and time, even if this is someone's native language. And then if you're unsure how to support someone or what they need, ask. Ask them if they're able to, to let you know or ask their caregivers or their family members. And finally, empathy. With empathy, people in the autism spectrum are going through a very confusing world with, min with a lot less information than most people have about basic things and how to interact with people. And they also have sensory assaults going on all day on top of that. So being aware of those and being empathetic to it can be really helpful. Some of the things not to do. Don't expect eye contact. Some people on the autism spectrum are fine with eye contact, many are not. And the reason for what I've been told by autistic adults is that when they're trying to process language and it's taking a lot of effort, eye contact on top of that is too much information. 
in some cases it can be physically painful. So it sounds counterintuitive, but the less you expect of someone giving eye contact and looking like they're listening to you, the more they're actually probably listening to you. In fact, I know of one boy who's a brilliant kid. He learns while he moves. So in a classroom, he is constantly running laps around the classroom, and he's picking it up. If you make that kid sit in a chair and be perfectly still while the lesson is going on, he's not getting it. Another thing is, as I've touched on briefly, don't touch or hug without permission. Even a simple touch to move someone along might be too much, might lead to a meltdown. So always check first. And then finally, avoid sudden changes. Once again, the world is a confusing place. So you wanna give people who are on spectrum some advance notice of what's going on and enough information that they can make sense of it. It's not enough to simply say, at three o'clock, we're going to art class. You wanna say at three o'clock, we're going to art class. That's 10 minutes from now. We'll be going to room 220, which is down the hall. Mr. Johnson will be taking you there. You will stay there for 45 minutes. That kind of information is going to help someone process that change and transition a lot better than, come on, we're going. Meltdowns versus tantrums. One of the things we talk about is, is what meltdowns are versus tantrums, because they can look similar, but they're very different. A tantrum is basically a goal-driven behavior designed to persuade the adult in charge to give in to the desires of the child. And once they've gotten that, they're done. It's really under the control of that child. A meltdown is really best described as behavior in the absence of effective communication. This is behavior is communication, and this is the way that the autistic person or autistic child is communicating that they're overwhelmed. They can be a response to sensory overload, to having too many choices, to not being able to pull up an answer, to being stuck in an emotion, any of those things that are just overwhelming to that person. They can be overwhelmed by things that a lot of people who aren't autistic wouldn't even notice. You know, like I said, you know, fluorescent lights can be too much, a small noise. And definitely if someone is already not feeling well, is hungry, is having other stresses in their life, they're going to have less ability to handle the additional stress and they'll become overwhelmed much more quickly. In terms of what to do about a meltdown, empathy, prevention, and time are what you're looking at. Trying to prevent a meltdown once again, by close observation of behavior, recognizing when someone is becoming stressed and overwhelmed and working to reduce that is going to be much more effective than trying to stop a meltdown once it's started. A meltdown is like a spiral. And it's just, once it starts and it reaches that point of no return, there's really not much you can do except to make sure the person is safe, everyone around them is safe, and that the person who's having the meltdown knows that they're supported. And then, because once it's over, they're gonna be tired. Unlike a tantrum, this isn't something that the autistic person is able to control. And they're not gonna stop if now they're given what, what they wanted. It's going to take time and effort. So by far the best way of handling a meltdown is trying to prevent one from occurring in the first place. And that's through careful observation. And then removing the stress or, or whatever is overwhelming the person as best you can. In supporting people in the autism spectrum, in, in living with them and working with them, considering the environment is of critical importance. Many people on spectrum process sensory input differently and can be easily overwhelmed by it. So one thing to be aware of is what is the environment around this person like? Is it too noisy for them? Are there too many smells coming in? Is it too cold or too hot? Has anxiety increased due to fear or safety? Those are all things that need to be considered uh, when you're supporting someone on the autism spectrum. Looking at supporting people on autism spectrum, some of the things to take into account are the circumstances, to look at behavior, as well as language supports, the concept of won't versus can't, and making time for breaks for both you and them. Under the idea of circumstances, people on spectrum tend to have sensory processing differences. So looking at the environment around them, trying to determine if 
you know, is there a trigger there? Is it too hot, too cold? Is it too noisy? Are the light fixtures upsetting to them? Those are the sorts of things to be looking at in the environment. What could be causing a stress or a trigger to someone who's autistic? And not just someone, the person that you're working with, because it is going to be so individual. Also, a lot of people on spectrum experience anxiety disorder. And oftentimes that will translate into having difficulties with transitioning between activities, especially away from a preferred activity to something less preferred. This is also why you see a lot of people on spectrum really responding well to patterns and routines. People in the world don't make a lot of sense. And having a pattern or routine, as well as rules, gives you a basis for understanding the world. When that pattern or routine is disrupted, then the world is not making sense again, and that can lead to a meltdown. So one of the ways to help with transitions is to give as much information as possible. Telling people when the transition is gonna occur and giving them lead up. You know, it's gonna be in 10 minutes, it's gonna be in five minutes. One thing about that though is that that can sometimes ratchet up anxiety unintentionally. So I always like to say, not only do you have to tell people about it, you have to sell them on it. Why are they going to be okay with this transition? Why are they going to enjoy going to art class and leaving behind their Legos or whatever it is? The other thing about supporting people on Spectrum is that behavior is communication. And I can't stress that enough. A lot of people on Spectrum, even if they're fully verbal, are not good at verbalizing their needs and emotions. And the way you understand what they're not able to say is by looking at their behavior because they will be communicating with you what their concerns are, what's triggering them, what's calming them down, how are they learning best. All of those things are being communicated without words necessarily. There's also language supports because people on the autism spectrum oftentimes process language differently. Visuals are oftentimes very helpful, presenting information in different ways having it written out, having a flow chart, having a picture, having different ways for people to access information is enormously helpful, as well as using literal language. Metaphors are not going to be helpful. Say exactly what you mean. Raining like cats and dogs? Yes, that is the cliche of someone looking for cats and dogs falling from the sky. It's raining heavily. <laughs> That's going to be a lot more helpful to someone who's on spectrum, particularly a younger child. And finally, slow down. It can take extra time to process language, and oftentimes language is one of the first skills to go when people are stressed. So take your time. Give them a few extra seconds to process language. Again, it has nothing to do with intellectual ability. But if you give the extra time and don't rush in to fill the silence, it's going to help the person process language better. If you say something and they're not getting it, so you repeat it and repeat it, that's just more language they have to try and process. And it can be very awkward because we're used to how the rhythms of our conversations go. But trying to give a few extra seconds really won't take that long and it's going to help communication a lot. Another concept is won't versus can't, which is often explored through collaborative problem solving, um, which can be Googled. But basically the idea is there's a difference between someone who won't do something, who is choosing not to do something, and someone who can't because they don't have the skills. It is far kinder to assume that this is a can't situation and try and see what skills and scaffolding that person needs in order to be successful in doing what you want them to do, rather than assuming that they are simply acting out and won't do it. For example, someone who won't stop stimming during church and it's upsetting to people, it's distracting. Well, that person probably needs to do that stim for some reason and is not simply there to annoy other people. You might try and look at you know, what it is that is causing the stimming. Is there something that's causing anxiety? Is just being in that situation anxiety producing? Is there some way around that? And like I said before, as long as that stim isn't harming someone, or, the, or others, it should be allowed to continue. And finally, making time for breaks for them and for you. For people on the autism spectrum, interacting with other people takes a lot of effort. Recess, for example, is generally not a time to recoup 
tokens and to, to rebuild and to rest and relax. It's very stressful. And interaction with other people, there's a lot of rules that they don't know about going on. There's a lot of things they're not getting. And it creates a lot of anxiety. For you as a caregiver or a parent, generally speaking, if you're a parent, your child is not giving you much of a break. And so you're going to have to find your own way to get them. And as I like to say sometimes, our kids on spectrum are just like other kids, but more so. So do take time for a break any way you can get, including the Autism Society of Oregon's Take a Break on ASO program. Autism spectrum disorder can either be diagnosed by a medical professional or identified through the school system. They are not the same thing. And you really, to access services available, you need both, both a medical diagnosis and an educational identification. The educational identification is through the schools. If the child is not yet school age, it's going to be through your local educational service district. There is no cost. It must be completed within either 45 or 60 school days, depending on the age of the child. When they do the evaluation, the child must meet both the criteria for autism spectrum disorder and a finding that the autism as experienced by the child is interfering with their ability to access education. So you have to have both of those parts. A medical diagnosis is performed by a medical professional. You will need a referral from your primary care physician to an autism specialist. There is not a time limit in which this must be done, so, and there are often long wait lists, especially for older children. OHP and private insurance oftentimes cover the cost, but not always, so you want to check. And there are oftentimes deductibles and co-pays that still will apply. The Autism Society of Oregon's website does have a list of medical professionals who will evaluate for autism spectrum disorder. It's not a complete list, and you should check with your insurance provider to see if they are covered. For an adult to obtain a medical diagnosis of autism, they can either go to a private provider. There are lists on the Autism Society of Oregon's website, and once again, it is not a full comprehensive list, and you should check with your insurance to see if they are covered. Oftentimes, the insurance or OHP will cover it, but you'll want to check with them, and out-of-pocket costs can still be substantial. No-cost ways for an adult to be evaluated for an autism spectrum disorder include going through vocational rehabilitation services. The adult must be either unemployed or underemployed, and they can contact Voc Rehab in their county and let them know that they think they may be on the autism spectrum and would like an evaluation to see if they qualify for services with Voc Rehab. In some cases, the County Developmental Disability Services Office may provide a free evaluation for adults, but that's going to depend on the county. The services that can be obtained by obtaining an educational identification for a child include qualifying for an IEP, which will qualify them for supports and services to help them access an education. Obtaining a medical diagnosis will allow the child or the adult to obtain medical services and therapies, including speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy as needed, and behavior therapy called applied behavior analysis through their medical providers. In Oregon, there are uh, no age limits, dollar limits, or visit limits, particularly for ABA, but there can also be long wait lists for that type of therapy. Another thing that a medical diagnosis opens people up for is developmental disability services. Those are through the county. They do provide supports and services to both adults and children who have an autism diagnosis. They will do an adaptive assessment to make sure that not only does this person have a medical diagnosis, but they also are impacted enough to be qualified for services. It will take 90 days minimum from the time of the application to have that application approved or denied. And then particularly for a child, if they don't already qualify for OHP, which is Oregon's Medicaid, um, due to their family income, a waiver can be processed, but that's going to take another 90 days. For more information, please check out the ASO website at autismsocietyoregon.org.